六五六日去爱心，明天天桥，三个不要打比赛。我个人的二队打三场输了，三场赢一。还没吃，还没吃，没吃。今
Okay, we get started. So the yeah, the swipe card scanner is just going around the room. So please swipe your uh, scan your card. Um, just to give a brief overview of what the weather has in store for the next few days. So I think the rain probably showed you some of these plots. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So here we've got the UK. It's a German website, this by the way, and. You can tell because the T, normally on an, on an English website, that would be L for low. So the T means low pressure on this website. So we've got low pressure here, we've got low pressure here. And in the Northern Hemisphere, we know the air moves anti-clockwise around low pressure. So the air is coming around in this direction. And because of this low, it comes around here. And we've got high pressure here, in the Northern Hemisphere, the air goes around high pressure anti-clockwise, sorry, clockwise. Goes around high pressure in a clockwise direction. Okay, so the, the kind of jet stream is moving in this direction. <coughs> and another thing that I find useful to look at is the 850 hectopascal pseudo potential temperature. Pseudo potential temperature is the variable that we defined last lecture. It's another word for the moist potential temperature basically. Slightly different but more or less the same thing. Probably less than a 1% difference in this variable. And this is what it looks like. Now pseudo potential temperature can tell us where the cold, the cold uh, in the warm areas, and we can see that because of this low pressure, this low pressure system here, warm air from the south is being wrapped around this low pressure system. So this low pressure system <coughs> in the North Atlantic is pulling warm air up, and that warm air is wrapping around that low pressure centre. And that creates this warm front, so the warm front here, the boundary between the cold air and the warm air, <coughs> and also a cold from here. So over the next few days, what we'll see is basically a cold from. So it's the boundary between this warm air and this cold air, and that cold from, as it moves past the UK, will, be, will bring a band of precipitation. So by Wednesday evening, I think it is, that's when we'll start to see some precipitation, around about 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, something like that. Maybe a little bit sooner. So this is 12 UTC on Mittwoch, which is Wednesday in German. Okay, so we should see some precipitation there. Then leading into the weekend, we've got another... Uh, another slight warm front, very weak, so we might see some very, very, um, not very strong drizzle Thursday, Friday, here, and then leading into the weekend it goes cold again, so this cold air comes down from the north, and we should feel, it should feel cold Saturday, Sunday. Uh, another useful thing that's useful that's interesting to look at are the upper air soundings. Now let's go back to the current situation. So low pressure here, low pressure here, high pressure here. Okay and so if I look at where we've got high pressure, look at this location here. So at the moment there's high pressure here Now the interesting thing about, this is a, uh, it's called a skew T diagram, very similar to a tephigram. Are you familiar with the tephigram? So I think Geraint talked about the tephigram. So we've got lines of constant pressure, like the tephigram. We've got lines of constant dry potential temperature. 
the other way. And we've got lines of constant moist potential temperature. Is that familiar to you? Okay, so the interesting thing about this tepigram or skew T diagram, when there's high pressure, what we can see, and it's over the ocean as well, we can see <coughs> a layer that has more or less constant dry potential temperature. So these are lines of constant dry potential temperature. Now this layer here, this very thin layer, going up to around about 940 hectopascals, so from the surface to 940, is fairly constant dry potential temperature. And then above that level, above about 960 hectopascals, or 940 hectopascals in this case, there's a marked inversion. You see that? So the temperature increases very rapidly. It's increasing very rapidly. And the reason for that is it's in a high, high pressure um, situation. So what's happening is the air's pushing down. There's flux from the surface. There's fluxes from the surface. So that just means that the air's moving upwards in thermals. But also because the large scale situation is high pressure, the large scale situation means that air is being forced down against these fluxes. And where they meet, you see this temperature inversion. Now, why do you see a temperature inversion? So in, last, in the last lecture, I showed you the, the cloud chamber example and showed that when you lower the pressure, when you have a high pressure and then it goes to, and, and then you lower the pressure, then you make a cloud. The air cools and you make a cloud. When I pumped air back into the chamber, what happened was the air heated up and the cloud evaporated. So what's happening is the, the air is descending, it's pushing down on the surface, that's why we feel a high pressure at the surface. And as it descends, the pressure increases, okay? So it increases and that causes the temperature to increase. That's why we see this area of, of this, this temperature measure, this high, this, this, this air above this level here has a higher temperature than the air below it. And it's just because it's descending and it's an adiabatic compression. Does that make sense? Um, the other interesting thing we see is that tells us that this air must have come from above and it's descending down. Is So if you remember from a tepigram, it's a plot of temperature, which is the rightmost line, and the other line is the dew point temperature. Are you familiar with that? It's a great we'll talk about that. Now the dew point temperature is very low compared to the actual temperature, which means the air is very dry, which tells us that the air must have come from above. Does that make sense? So let's have a, another look at one, another radio sound here. So I'm going to have a look at, in, in a region where we, I know we've got low pressure. So in the southwest. Here. It looks very different. So you don't see that sharp, that sharp temperature inversion. You see that? We're not seeing that at all. And there's a, um, this layer here going up to 700 hectopascals or so is more or less saturated. It tells us that we've probably got clouds in this area because the dew point is very close to the actual temperature. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. So let's move on to lecture slides for a bit. So we last lecture we talked about why does a cloud form in the atmosphere. So the air saturates with water vapour, we found this. And condensation takes place on aerosol particles, cloud condensation nuclei. And we thought about what is a cloud, and it's an ensemble of droplets or ice crystals that are suspended in the air. Uh, we considered how much water vapour the air can hold, and this is described by the clausius clapeyron equation. Okay, I didn't go into too many details there. And how does the air temperature affect how much water vapour it can hold? Well, lower temperatures 
implies a lower saturation vapour pressure, which means at lower temperatures the air can hold less water vapour. By the way, I've, I've sent you all an email this morning, which is to my web page, which is here. So I think Grain also links to this web page too, so you'll find it from his web page. But this is for my part of the course. So I've got a syllabus and a module description. That's a PDF, what's a document. Um, there's some, some, some other references for my part of the course. And each week, we have the lecture material, so this is lecture one, lecture two for this week. We have the slides, we've got some notes. You see some notes here, that's, that's for this week. And some problems to try, you want to try the problems. So these are basically exam, exam type questions, so you get to practice those. So there's questions there and there's answers to so you can check that you're understanding the material as we go through it. Um, you'll see that subsequent lectures haven't appeared yet. Now they'll appear before the lecture, so they'll appear as we go along. Okay, so maybe a couple of days before we have the lecture, they'll start to appear there. Okay, if you want to see last year's material, then it is available. It might change a little bit this year as I update the slides, but if you just delete um, the HTML file and press enter you can see all the PowerPoints are, are in this directory so we've got lecture, lecture 1, lecture 2, lecture 3 and so on and other materials like the PDFs are in a subdirectory so I've sent you all that link okay so this week Oh yeah, so yeah. Also, we, we thought about this this point. Are there any situations in the atmosphere where parcel theory, which is what we talked about last lecture, describes the clouds well? And there is, and I told you they were in, in stratocumulus clouds. So very thin layer clouds that sit at the top of the boundary layer. So we can describe the liquid water content in those clouds by using parcel theory. And it's a fair, fairly good approximation. Uh, we talked about aerosol particles, so in the cloud chamber that I showed you, you saw the importance of aerosol particles. If you didn't have aerosol particles, you didn't have a cloud. And one thing that we didn't cover is that not, uh, not all aerosol particles grow into cloud droplets. So if you have aerosol particles in the cloud chamber, if you have say 100 of them, not all of that 100 will, will grow into 100 cloud drops and there's reasons why that we'll consider today. Okay, so here's types of clouds. So the types of clouds we've covered so far are these kind of very thin stratocumulus clouds. You may think, what's, what's the relevance of these? They only occupy a you know, fairly narrow part of the atmosphere. Surely a cumulonimbus is more significant, so deep. Actually, no, stratocumulus clouds are probably one of the most important cloud types climatically from a climate point of view. And that's because they have a very large spatial coverage. Whereas cum cumulus clouds and stratocum and sorry, cumulus clouds and cumulonimbus clouds, although they're very big, they don't cover large areas. So these are ve a very significant cloud type. <coughs> You should also, when you, when you look at the notes, when you look at the PDF, that's on my webpage. So there's some extra information about these different cloud types. So you should look at that. You should try and remember some of these cloud types too, because it may appear on the exam. So part of the exam, I want you to recall what some of these cloud types are. So we talked about number of cloud condensation nuclei being important and the reason for that in stratocumulus clouds was that the liquid water content is determined by the thermodynamic properties of the air. Okay, it doesn't matter what the aerosol particles are, as long as you've got some aerosol particles, you know what the liquid water content is in a stratocumulus pretty much. 
if there's no precipitation, oddly tips. Um, but in terms of the radiative effect, if we have fewer aerosol particles, then we have bigger cloud drops, and we have fewer cloud drops. And if we have more, we have smaller cloud drops more of them. But the total surface area, the total surface area of, of the cloud increases. And radiatively, that's important. Okay, so when I say radiatively, I mean how much solar radiation is reflected back to space. So just to show you some examples that tell us that I, I told you that parcel theory is a fairly good approximation for the liquid water content in a stratocumulus. We use aircraft to investigate the properties of clouds. This is one of them. So this is the facility for airborne atmospheric measurements aircraft that we use. It's based down in Cranfield and we fly this aircraft through clouds, the scientists sit in there. It's basically a passenger aircraft that's been converted to a science aircraft. There's instruments that sit on the wings and we use these instruments on the wings to characterize the clouds. One experiment we, done, we, we did recently to look at stratocumulus clouds was based on the west coast of Chile where there's a huge deck of stratocumulus clouds. So this is a satellite image looking down and this is just one flight of the aircraft flying out into that stratocumulus deck, sampling it and flying back basically. And where you see these stars, that's where measurements were taken in the vertical. So uh, we dropped a radio sonde and measured the vertical profile in the atmosphere. So these are, it's called a drop sonde. So radio sondes, you know, you've seen radio sonde ascents. We also have a drop sonde that we drop from the aircraft, which goes through a layer in the atmosphere and measures the thermodynamic properties. So this is a drop sonde measurement in the strategy. So those three drop sondes that were dropped through the cloud. And you can see that the potential temperature theta is constant in this layer until we get to cloud base, which is, which is about here and it changes slightly, and then we have this inversion. Okay, so this is, again, it's in a high pressure, an area of high pressure. So the air is being pushed down onto this cloud layer, and there's fluxes from the ocean, we push up against it, and where they meet, you see this jump in potential temperature, you see this jump in temperature. So below this level is called the boundary layer. Of course, parcel theory is only an approximation, so this is a, a numerical simulation. So this is, uh, we have models that simulate the actual fluid dynamics in the atmosphere. So we consider a warm bubble which rises through the atmosphere. You'll see very quickly there's all this mixing from the sides. Okay, so I told you that parcel theory is a good approximation for calculating the liquid water content in a stratocumulus cloud, most of the time. In certain situations, we get a lot of mixing, okay? And that causes air from above the inversion to mix into the cloud layer. That's known as entrainment, entrainment. I'll write that down. No, I can't write it down. Entrainment. Climate modelers hate entrainment because it's a small scale process. So what that means is their models, the climate models, cannot resolve this process. They cannot resolve the mixing that occurs between the air above the inversion and the cloud layer. And that causes problems because they, climate modelers, like to be able to calculate the radiative properties of clouds. So you'll hear that climate models struggle to calculate the cloud feedbacks and the cloud radiative properties. And mainly it's because of this problem, a lack of resolution in the model, which means you can't resolve these mixing processes. Okay. 
Right. Uh, so I'm going to extend. So let's just assume that we can calculate the liquid water content in the cloud reasonably well to start with. Let's just work on that premise. So I'm going to extend Geraint's, um, Geraint's analysis of the tepigram a little bit so we can start to look at clouds. I'm not sure how far Geraint took this. So this, this image here is a tepigram. It's got all these different colours on it. We've got lines of constant theta, that's drive the tension temperature. We've got lines of constant pressure, which you're familiar with. We've got the blue lines, which are lines of constant moist potential temperature. We've got the magenta lines, which are lines of constant vapor mixing ratio in grams per kilogram. So two and a half grams per kilogram, nine, 20, so on. So let's say I was to give you some initial conditions of a parcel. So you go along, you walk along the ground with a thermometer and something to measure dew point, and you measure at the ground that the temperature is plus 16.5 degrees Celsius, and you measure the dew point to be 8.4 degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's so from this data, you can calculate the height of, of cloud base. It's known as the lifting condensation level. Has Grain talked about that? Yeah, okay. And you can calculate, well, if I gave you the cloud top, you can calculate the liquid water mixing ratio in the cloud. Did Grain talk about that? Maybe not. Don't think he did. <laughs> okay. So, did you talk about no man's rule? No man's rule, no man's rule. So basically, your initial temperature goes on the plot, your initial dew point goes on the plot, and then what you do is you draw a line of constant potential temperature, starting where you measure the temperature, and you draw a line of constant vapor mixing ratio. So these lines have to be parallel to the magenta lines, these lines have to be parallel to the lines of constant potential temperature, and where they meet, that's where cloud base is. So you know about that? Good that before. So cloud base from the tepigram, we can read off, it's about seven degrees Celsius, and the mixing ratio, the vapor mixing ratio at cloud base, it works out to be, if you, if you put a ruler on here and figure out how, how further on, how, how far between six and nine this point is, it's about 6.9 grams per kilogram. So that's the saturation vapor mixing ratio. <clears throat> so I told you also that the cloud top temperature, 870 hectopascals. So once the air is saturated, then the temperature moves along lines of constant moist potential temperature. In other words, as the parcel moves up, its temperature and its pressure have to be such so that the lines parallel to these blue lines, these blue dashed lines. Like that. And so at cloud top, which is 870 hectopascals, about here, we can read off what the saturation vapor mixing ratio is there too. And the saturation vapor mixing ratio at cloud top is 6.7 grams per kilogram. So what's the cloud water content? You want to say? I'm hearing two. Two what? I think I'm hearing two. So this is all of the vapour. Uh, cloud based, there's only vapour. There's no liquid. If you, well, if you're just warmer than cloud base, then water's in the, in the vapour phase, it's not the liquid phase. So this is vapour. And at the top, we've got both liquid and vapour. But the vapour content is 6.7 grams per kilogram. So what's the liquid water content? Quite easy. 
take my, take this from this. 0.2 grams per kilogram. It gives you an idea of kinds of liquid water content values you'd, you'd expect. So just make sure you can do that. I know it seems fairly straightforward now, but if you don't practice it, you'll forget it by the time the exam comes along. Okay. So just to show you some measurements, so um, I mean I said that the adiabatic liquid water mixing ratio parcel theory is a good approximation for the liquid water content in a stratocumulus cloud. From these measurements you can see it's not really. <laughs> and the reason why we did this experiment is because in this part of the world that, that mixing process, that entrainment between the air above and below uh, the inversion is quite important for these cloud types. So this is liquid water content it's um, grams per meter cube. It's kind of the same as liquid water mixing ratio. Liquid water mixing ratio is grams per kilogram, so there's a slight difference there. But you can see it rises as you move from cloud base to cloud top, but then there's this region at cloud top where it's not really, well, it doesn't look adiabatic, it doesn't increase with, with altitude. And that's because air, dry air is being mixed in from the cloud top. It's this entrainment process. So that field experiment was all about characterising this entrainment process to improve the representation of clouds in climate models and weather forecast models. Um, some other measurements, the concentration of, of cloud drops. So you can see, by and large, OK, there's, there's a variability. But these, these measurements correspond to these measurements too. This is mass and this is cloud drop number concentration. So the number of cloud drops per unit volume. So you can see that by and large, it's fairly constant with height. Would you agree? Maybe, maybe not. But it's quite variable. When we get to cloud top, it's even more variable. And in certain situations, maybe it decreases a little bit with height. But uh, the signature of constant cloud drop number concentration with height means that there's probably no mixing processes going on. And also, there's probably no precipitation processes going on. Because if rain started to form, then you might expect that the, the concentration would decrease as some of those droplets fall out. OK. So I just thought I'd show you some real data. Um, Okay. I'm going to skip past this now. Right, I want to show you a little experiment. So I like to show these experiments in most of my lectures to sort of um, make it a bit more interesting. I've given it away there with that slide. Oops. So it's a cup of water, hopefully this works. It's a cup of water and I'm going to place a tube in that cup of water. And see what happens. Hopefully it normally works this. So can you see the level of water in that tube? Can anyone see that? It's below the actual level. I know it's quite difficult actually. Let's try again. Can you see the level of water in the tube? It's about maybe a centimetre below where it was then. Now it's only about two millimetres below. Can you see that? Maybe? 
Okay, take it from me, it is. <laughs> so the level of water in the tube is two centimetres below. Two centimetres, two millimetres below. That's important for <coughs> understanding how, <coughs> how aerosol particles form cloud droplets. Okay, so I'll tell you why. So you might want to write some of this down. So what that experiment showed is that if we have a glass of water, that's the level of water, and we insert a tube that's non-wetting, the tube doesn't wet. And the, the level of the water inside the tube sits below the main level. Why is that? Does anyone know why that is? Why does it sit below the main level? Do you know? Okay, that's all right. Maybe we'll learn something then. Okay. So I'm going to draw a slightly bigger diagram. So this is my tube. We couldn't see it, but it turns out that the water in the tube has a curved surface. So it's slightly curved. Okay. Now the vapour pressure over liquid water, you all know, is described by the clausius clapeyron relation. And at equilibrium, it will be the saturation vapour pressure. So we'll call that E0. You familiar with that? Equilibrium between two phases given by the clausius clapeyron relation. I think Geraint's talked about that too. <coughs> talked about the saturation vapour pressure. Yeah? Okay. So, vapour pressure over, over this curved surface I'll call EV. And the pressure at the same level as where this, um, the level inside the tube is, we'll call pH. It's the pressure at depth H in the fluid below the surface. Z is measured going downwards in this system. Are you, is that okay? You follow the diagram? Okay, so. So the total pressure outside the tube, so outside the tube, oops, at H. So we can write that down as EH equals E naught here plus, now this is liquid, so it has a constant density pretty much, I'll call it rho of liquid, rho of water, a thousand kilograms per meter cubed, times G times H. So that's just the hydrostatic equation that Geraint's talked about. So rho G H, that's the weight of liquid above, we'll call that equation one. And the total pressure at H inside the tube, so inside here, 
we can write down as EH is the same, it's at the same level, so the pressure here is equal to the pressure here. So EH is equal to E0 at the surface and it's going to be EV minus E0, I could have just wrote that, sorry, plus EV minus E0, I could have just wrote that as EV. Plus, there's an additional pressure. There's, an, there's a pressure as we cross this boundary. So, so there's a change in pressure. We call this delta P C for the pressure in a capillary tube. So that's equation two. Now, the pressure EV, what is it equal to? So we can use the hydrostatic relation for vapour, hydrostatic. Are you familiar with the hydrostatic equation, dp by dz? Has Geraint talked about that? So dp by dz, so de by dz equals, I think you had minus rho g, yeah? We're measuring Z increasing going down, so we don't have the minus. And if we use the ideal gas law to find what the density is, it's just the pressure divided by the gas constant divided by temperature times G. So that's the hydrostatic equation. Same as Geraint talked about. So that's an aside. So when we solve this equation we get an exponential and what we'll find is that EV is E0, the initial pressure, times EXP and it's GH over RVT. That's the solution to this equation for a constant temperature. So that's equation three. Yep. Combine one and two. So we have Set them both equal, E0 plus rho LGH equals EV, because they cancel, plus delta P. And if we say that E0 is approximately equal to EV, so that the difference can be neglected, so that's an approximation. Then we can write that H equals delta P C over rho L times G, and that's equation four. So the height that this, this capillary, this droplet, sits below the surface is given by the change in pressure across it divided by the density of the liquid times gravity, okay? And we can substitute four, equation four, into equation three. So there's H here. So I'm going to write it down here to find. So four in three <coughs> gives us EV equals E naught EXP delta PC over RL RV times T. Okay. So that tells me what the pressure over this curved surface is. And the pressure over this curved surface is higher than the pressure over the flat surface. That's interesting. That's relevant to cloud formation. So the final thing I want to consider is what's the pressure, what's that pressure drop, delta P? And it's known as the Lapla Laplace pressure. Physicists may have covered this before. So we have a curved surface. So try and draw. So this is supposed to be a circle and this is supposed to be a hemisphere. Then if this circles in contact with the liquid 
then there's a surface tension force pulling down around this circle we'll call this delta F sigma for surface tension and if there's a change in pressure across this boundary delta PC there's a pressure gradient force pushing up against it and the two have to balance so delta F sigma and delta F P and if we consider an area element so physicists will have talked about area elements when looking at you know integrals volume integrals area integrals then the area element in spherical coordinates delta A don't worry if you don't know where this comes from it doesn't really matter too much r squared sine theta d theta d phi have you seen that before and we basically if we know what the what the pressure what the pressure drop is across this then we can work out the force pressure is force over area so force delta fp equals delta PC so force is pressure times area times DA and DA is R squared sine theta D theta D phi so all I've done there is taken this pressure drop and multiplied by the area element so a patch of small area on this hemisphere I, if you consider the elements of force that this calculates there are components that, that are perpendicular components that are parallel we only need to consider the components that are parallel to delta F sigma because the other components cancel so there's a force pointing in this direction there's an equal and opposite force pointing in this direction so that turns out to be delta Fp multiplied by cosine theta just to separate these vectors out into their components part, component parts so the total force Fp is a double integral and I'm just going to integrate add up all these, these elements of force delta Pc which is a constant r squared sine theta and there's a cos theta as well just to get the component that's parallel d theta d phi and we need to integrate phi going from 0 to 2 pi and we need to in integrate theta going from 0 to pi over 2 Does that make sense? when we do that we find delta pc times pi r squared so fairly straightforward so the magnitude of the force due to the pressure gradient is the change in pressure times pi r squared set those two equal oh yeah so surface tension forces um, to get the surface tension force we'll have to equate balance these two forces the surface tension force S sigma is just going to be 2 pi r the circumference of the circle times the surface tension of water and that's, that's the total force and if we equate those two forces we find 2 pi r 2 pi sigma, sigma r equals delta pc pi r squared one of the r's cancels one of the pi's cancels and we're left with the Laplace pressure delta pc equals 2 sigma over R. So that's known as the pressure inside a drop. Or Laplace pressure. Laplace the first to derive that formulation. So this is also the pressure inside a balloon. If you inflate a balloon, then the surface tension of the elastic sigma and the radius of the balloon is inversely proportional to the pressure. Okay, so um, so that's Laplace pressure. Now, 
we just need to insert that into here to find the final point of today. So we'll call this equation 5, I guess. And insert equation 5 into, well, we'll call this 4a, to find that the vapour pressure over a curved surface is equal to the vapour pressure over a flat surface times this exponential so we've got 2 sigma over rho L R V T and there's an R in there as well and that's the final derivation and this is known as Kelvin's equation after Lord Kelvin who first derived it so Lord Kelvin derived it slightly differently, derived it from thermodynamics principles alone, but the final result is exactly the same. Okay, so it's basically the vapour pressure over a droplet, or a curved droplet, is higher than the vapour pressure over a curved surface. Does that seem strange to you? This does cause a little bit of confusion. So I'm just going to talk briefly about what it means and what the implications are. I've gone through this, gone through this. So why is the vapour pressure over a curved surface higher than a flat surface? And the textbooks say, because as the drop gets smaller, the Laplace pressure builds up and cause it to evaporate. Well, I prefer this explanation. So if you think about a flat surface, so this is water below here, this is the surface. If you think about a single water molecule on the surface there, it experiences intramolecular forces with all of its neighbors, and even it's a long range force too. So not just its direct neighbor, but all of its neighbors within the vicinity. And if you think about the force, the forces that influence it, well, you've got forces coming down, you've got forces along here. So there's a net force pulling it in. Okay? And in order, if this molecule experiences some thermal motion, it can overcome these forces and evaporate so it can escape from the surface. If you think about a curved surface, then the molecule on the surface here experiences intermolecular forces, but there are some missing. So there's not as many, there aren't as many. The force pulling this down into, into the drop isn't as strong as the force pulling it down for a flat surface. So that means that this drop, this molecule even, can escape from this surface more easily than this one can. Okay? So if this surface exists, if this droplet exists, there must be an additional pressure pushing it in from the outside, and that's the vapor pressure. So what we say is, in order for this droplet to exist, there needs to be an, ad there needs to be an additional vapour pressure. Does that make sense? Okay. How, how is that relevant for cloud formation? Well, think about aerosol particles. I said at the start of the lecture, not all aerosol particles are cloud condensation nuclei. And a big factor is the size. If you have really small aerosol particles, then you need a higher vapour pressure in order to push water molecules to them. So the air needs to become what we call supersaturated. Not just saturated, but supersaturated. So there needs to be some force pushing the molecules to the droplets. So if we look at Kelvin's equation, that's Kelvin's equation. And it basically says that the smaller the water drop, the higher the vapour pressure. If we look at how it depends on drop radius, so we've got <coughs> 1,000 nanometers.